All right, guys, welcome, welcome. So thank you for joining us in this space. Most of you are probably like, where in the world are we? So um, welcome to SaxWorks. SaxWorks is our new and innovative membership club designed for both work and life. So I don't know about you guys, but during the pandemic, something that I felt like I lost that was personal to me was kind of a sense of community, but also just that sense of connection. So one thing we really strive to do at SaxWorks is really democratize what community means to us. And to me, it means connection. It means connecting to myself, connecting to other people, and connecting to each other and our purpose as well. And so one thing we really try to do here is democratize the tools for well-being, whether that's for our physical, emotional, behavioral health. What I've learned is that when I solve for my own physical, emotional, behavioral health and I prioritize that, I feel like I free up so much more energy to be able to put back into my own work, to put back into my life, to put back into the community that's around me. So at SaxWorks, that's what we're trying to do. Welcome to our design spaces. And I think Dory Clark, our guest of honor tonight, speaks so gracefully to that, specifically around how we can basically design our lives to create these marginal little improvements, to create these healthy behavioral changes and habits that make all the difference over time. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Terry Clark, who will be our moderator tonight. Sorry, Terry Rice and Dory Clark. <laughs> we have an wow. announcement, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> So without further ado, thank you guys for joining us, and I'll turn it over. I almost went with the Terry Clark thing. It sounded great, so I appreciate that. Uh, my name is Terry Rice. I'm not Jerry Rice. I'm not Terry Clark. It's Terry Rice. And I'm a business development consultant. I'm also a staff writer at Entrepreneur Magazine. And a huge, huge fan of Dory Clark. So, so excited to be here. Um, but I want to tell a quick story first before I actually get started here. Uh, this is June of 2020. I get an email from Dory saying, hey Terry, me and some of my friends are going to go to Central Park. We're going to have this COVID-friendly get-together. Would you like to go? And in my head, I'm like, yeah, I want to go. But it was a Sunday in June, and it happened to be Father's Day. I happen to have four kids. <laughs> so I'm like, hmm, Father's Day is technically supposed to be for the dad. So do I have to be with them, or should I have something that I enjoy? <laughs> so, just oh out, so just hang out with Dory. And I'm thinking to myself, like, if I turn this down, I might never get invited to do stuff with her again. But you gotta play the long game. You gotta play the long <laughs> game. Think, you know what? She's a good person. I have value to provide the world. And I'm, you know, I'm just gonna turn this down and be with my kids. And hopefully, hopefully, I'll get another chance to hang out with her again. 18 months later, here we are right now. And I'm hanging out with Dory so well again. <laughs> So Dory, uh, obviously you need no introduction, but if you want to just go ahead and just briefly explain to some people who might be, you know, missing out some of the highlights of who you are and uh, tell us a little bit of information about the long game here. Thank you very much, Terry. And I just want to say uh, hello, streaming audience. Hi, Mama. And, uh, and hi, welcome everyone for being here. This is such a, a special evening for me. I really want to thank um, all the team, Rachel and Nicole and Cheyenne here at SaxWorks for having this because as you can imagine, it's not the easiest thing in the world to organize a COVID era book launch gathering. And so they really stepped up and created this amazing space, which opened two weeks ago. This is brand wow. new. You were among the first people to see uh, the beautiful SaxWorks. And of course, you know, they meticulously checked everyone's vaccination status to ensure a wonderful, safe evening for our intimate group. So I'm so happy you guys are here. And if we haven't had a chance to talk or if we haven't met yet, please come up and say hi to me afterwards because that's the whole point of a, a small group. But uh, for those who do not know me, uh, I'm Dory Clark. I teach for Duke, Duke University's Equa School of Business and uh, Columbia Business School. And, uh, and I, write, I write books, and I do coaching, and speaking, and consulting. But really what I try to accomplish with my books, where possible, is find a way to help democratize information about how we can actually best make an impact in the world. As I built my business 15 years ago, I really discovered that, number one, it was kind of hard. And number two, a lot of the information that we most want about, you know, well, how, how do some people break through? How do you get successful? How do you get known? Um, that was really hard to come by. 
And it seemed like some things were working and some things weren't, but it wasn't really clear, it wasn't really obvious, and it felt sometimes like people who should be sharing information weren't. And honestly, that just, that just really uh, pissed me off. And so I wanted to figure out answers for myself, and I also wanted to figure out answers for other people. And so in the work that I've done and in my books, this is the fourth one, um, I really tried in various ways to open up access to information so that good people can get their ideas heard and be able to have more of an impact and, and be successful in the ways that they want. Um, so that's really how I think about the work that I do, and uh, I try to bring, you know, to, to take it to 11 with uh, the long game. And uh, I'm excited to talk with, with you and with Terry about it tonight. Awesome, thank you. So one thing I like about the long game is you talk about the need for white space, right? Because we're always busy doing something, right? We feel like if we're not doing something, we're not there. And that leads to anxiety and a scarcity mindset might be there. But it's so hard to fight for that white space sometimes because you're like, well, if I have time, I should do something, right? And we always fall back into that trap. And on my end, the other day, I was talking to one of my business partners, and I'm like, I just need a break. I just went and did yoga for 45 minutes. And it felt great, and I came back more refreshed, but I felt guilty in regards to taking that time for myself. So, you know, how can we just maintain that? How can we fight for that white space? How do we maintain it? How do we explain it to business partners or other, or other maybe stakeholders? How can we get this white space initially? Yeah, thank you, Terry. Well, you know, it reminds me actually about a conversation that I had with a, a friend of mine, and she was just feeling so burned out. She was, you know, really exhausted. I think, like, probably a lot of us have felt during the pandemic. And she was just saying, oh my God, she's like, I, I, I feel like I need a sabbatical. I feel like I need to take like a year off. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's great. But then, then I said, you know, so a year off is, is amazing, but, you know, maybe you could just start with a day off. Like, maybe that would help. <laughs> she's like, you're right, actually. Because so so often, these problems feel almost insurmountable to us. We feel like the answer has to be some extreme solution. Oh, I'm gonna you know, go off for a year, that's what I need. Maybe you do need it, but something that, that helps often is just the small, the small thing, the small piece that we're not doing. And I think that oftentimes we can be able to get some of the space and the relief that we need with, uh, with less effort than we might imagine. There are some things that take more effort, but when it comes to creating mental space, sometimes it's, it starts at least with something as small as stepping away from a yoga class. You know, one of the things that I like to say is that playing the long game or being a strategic thinker, it, people often erect, I think, false boundaries. They say, well, I can't do that because I can't take a year off, or I can't have a strategy retreat, I have too many things to do. It's not about time. I, from my, a previous book of mine, Stand Out, I interviewed David Allen, who some of you may know is a big productivity guru, he wrote the book Getting Things Done, and he had a great expression. He said, it's not that it takes time to have you know, brilliant ideas or whatever, what it takes is space. And that's really what I wanted to help provide framework for in the long game, is to show people how to create some of that mental space so that even with the limited time that we have, because you know, we are busy people, we are nonetheless able to step back and think about things in a better and cleaner way, with a little bit more perspective. And so to answer your question, how can we, how can we actually get started doing it? There's a bunch of strategies. I, we can go into more depth about any of them, and I, I do in the long game. But just at a basic level, one framework that I share in the book that I've found to be helpful, and I'll quickly lay it out in case it's useful for you guys. I have come up with a set of four questions that I ask myself these days when I am faced with uh, a question about whether I should do something. I heard pens, I'm flicking as soon as you said that. So, <laughs> so take, take notes on that already. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, you know, checklists are good for everything, right? If you're a fan of Atul Balwande, the New Yorker writer and doctor, you know, right? Whether you're a medical doctor, whether you're an airplane pilot, checklists matter. And checklists matter for us too, because we try, but in the moment, we forget. That's the nature of being human. So the four questions that we can ask ourselves when you are faced with a decision about doing or not doing something. Number one, what is the total cost? Because we tend to systematically underestimate what it actually takes to do something. Oh, hey, will you do this webinar for us? It's only an hour. Well, okay, 
It's only an hour except for the hour to create the slides, the three prep calls, and the back and forth. So we need to ask ourselves, would I actually want to spend three to four hours doing that? Because that's the real question. Number two, what is the physical and emotional cost of doing something? If you accept an engagement at a time when you are already at your wit's end, when you are already burned out, when you are already tired, it actually should rise to a higher level. There needs to be a higher bar. In the long game, I tell the story about actually turning down an invitation to give a talk in Grand Cayman because, which sounds pretty great, but I, when I thought about it, I realized I was traveling the week before and I was traveling the week after. Did I really want to live out of a suitcase for three weeks? Would I enjoy that? And the answer was no. Question number three, what's the opportunity cost? So often, the way we frame questions to ourselves is should I do this or should I not do this? That is the wrong question. The right question is should I do this or should I literally do anything else in the world that takes that amount of time? Anything. And then number four, would I feel bad in a year if I did not do this? That's the frame. So many things fade into the background a year later. We don't even remember. I literally don't even remember the picnic I invited Terry to. Oh, I guess it was fun. I don't know if I was the either, so. I know, should have come with me. But no, actually, Terry, one of the reasons that I wanted Terry to be the MC for this evening is that Terry's actually a star of the book. Uh, there's a number of people here tonight, actually, who are some of the characters that I feature in The Long Game, but Terry is one of them. And in fact, uh, we tell the story about him uh, making strategic sacrifices for his family. So Terry is walking the talk, and uh, you know, it's, in the end, it's all about decisions and making, being willing to make those decisions. So I hope that answers your question. It does, and you bring up a really good point in regards to saying yes or no, because one problem I have with the yes or no is if the event is like two months from now, hey, can you do this in November? I'm like, sure, does November really exist? Ugh. And also it's November, I'm like, great, <laughs> my, my schedule's booked up. And um, when, I, when, I, when I think about that, I think, you know, the opportunity cost, is what else could you be doing in the world besides that? Maybe you could write a really good blog or do some outreach. Like, what else could you be doing in that time as opposed to what someone's asking you to do? So I think it's brilliant you brought that up. But one of the many things I like about you is you practice what you preach. You're not just reading theories and saying, hey, let me write this because it sounds cool. And I know one thing that you do now is you take Fridays off. I'll see you on Instagram, you'll have pictures like, hey, here's a donut. I'm like, hey, here's my cats. But like, you're not working anymore. I'd love to just know. Just eating donuts with my cats. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a, a form of work. Um, but, but can you just tell me, like, was there apprehension before you chose to make that decision? And what are the outcomes of taking every Friday off that you've experienced? Yeah, good question, Terry. Thank you. And I'll just say, for people who have come in late, it's OK. This is a good moment. You can come up and, and get closer if, you, if you'd like. If you're a little too far back and you want to come uh, sit in, this is, a, this is a great opportunity. So, uh, so feel free to, to do that and resettle. See all kinds of nice, nice friends joining us, so welcome. So to the point about Fridays off, so the first, uh, the, first the, the, the first caveat, which I will tell you is a strategic caveat, just in case anyone wants to gotcha me, is that for the past month, I have yielded my Fridays <laughs> off for the book launch. And that is a strategic choice. One of the points that I actually make in the long game, uh, I have a section where I talk about thinking in waves. And I think one of, one of the, the key points is that Life is both a sprint and a marathon. It really is both. And one of the secrets is just understanding which mode that you're in. When you are in book launch mode, I would argue it's relatively irresponsible to be keeping up your work-life balance. That's not a time to be balanced. But then you know there are moments when you over-index, and then you can under-index. And so I already have a plan. I've been mapping it out for months now, which is that in January and February, I am going to take what I will call a quasi-sabbatical. I'm not cutting everything out. I'm still going to talk to my coaching clients and, and things like that. But I am going to be reducing all discretionary work and pushing it back to March. So I'm probably going to reduce my workload by about 90% during those months. 
Um, and that's a strategic choice because I, I probably increased my workload by 90% over the past few months for this. So we have to understand the waves. It's not a problem to work too much for a short period of time. It becomes a big problem if that is how our whole lives are. So to the point about uh, Fridays off, I'm actually very excited. Uh, tomorrow is my first actual Friday off in a while. So I, am, I, have, the whole, I have the whole plan. Uh, I am going to the Theater on Film and Tape Archive to go see a musical. Uh, that is that is very exciting. Um, I'm, I'm having uh, I'm having a mammogram because one has to be responsible. This responsible middle age. So you know hashtag role model. <laughs> so doing all the things right. So I'm, I'm getting I'm getting back to uh, to uh, just you know being being productive in other facets of my life. Hopefully. That does not sound like a Friday off, um, but, but I, I think it's a good lesson and a good message to spread to everyone. And what you're describing to an extent is uh, what Gary Vaynerchuk calls macro strategy but micro hustle. Like there are moments when you gotta go in, you gotta go hard, you, you know, you can't take these, these times off to go do yoga or anything, but it has to be all part of a long-term plan, otherwise you're like this, this hamster on, on a wheel. And going back to just getting more white space, that involves saying no sometimes. And what I found before is I took too long to say no because I want to say it nicely. So I'm like, okay, let me just put this off, put it off, put it off. I'm like, well, now I'm just ghosting. I didn't even say no, I just ghosted. So uh, on your end, can you give us some tips on how to say no to good opportunities or bad opportunities, but in a way that doesn't burn bridges or offend anyone? Yeah, I think you, you raised such a good point, Terry, because for a lot of us, because, because we feel bad saying no, we get a little avoidance. And then that, of course, compounds the problem, right? Because before it was like, oh, it's so bad, I'm saying no. And now it's like, oh, I'm saying no, and I missed the event, and I'm an asshole. <laughs> it's like, oh, let's just make it worse. So, you know, that's that's humanity for us, right? We kind of dig our hole deeper inadvertently. And so what I noticed is interesting, and perhaps you guys have experienced this, when you actually have a quote unquote legitimate reason for not doing something, you respond pretty quickly, right? I know I do. Oh my gosh, thanks for the invitation, Terry. I can't because it's my mom's birthday, so I have to take her out that night. Okay, you do that, you don't feel bad. You answer right away, it's clean, it's done. The problem is when you don't have what you feel is a legitimate excuse. It's, oh well, I'm too busy, or I'm too worn out, or gosh, I just don't really feel like that, or whatever. It turns out that's actually a legitimate excuse too. You don't have to do anything. But because we feel bad about those reasons, we drag our feet on responding. And that's what ends up uh, making the challenge more severe. So there's a, a few things. The first is that I have really tried to get clear on understanding that whatever the reason that I don't want to do something, it actually is a legitimate reason. You know, and you can just get back and you don't have to provide some elaborate excuse. It's just, you know, oh, thank you so much, Terry. That sounds like such a nice invitation. I can't make it, but thank you and have fun. Easy. You know, it's, if you are responsible in getting back to people, 99 times out of 100, they will not be offended. Um, so that's, that's a piece of it. The second strategy that I really like is if for some reason you, you feel like you really can't say no, uh, maybe they, you owe them a favor, or maybe there's just some extenuating reason. You know, they're an important person, you can't say no. There are often standard ways that people approach you uh, to do things. Oftentimes people will ask for a meal of some kind, they'll ask for a coffee of some time, type, or they'll ask for a call. Those are sort of the, the standard ones. For each of those, what I also suggest, if you can't say no, is find a way, if you're not loving the request, see if you can downgrade it. So you can say, oh Terry, you know, I, I'd love to see you and, and catch up, or I'd love to you know, answer the questions you have. I'm so slammed right now, I can't do a meal, but why don't we set up a call? And the truth is, because we recognize from doing the analysis, like, oh, what's the real cost? A meal is not an hour, guys. A meal is two hours, two and a half hours to get there, to wait, they're late, you're late, there's traffic. So setting up a call instead means that you're taking a two hour engagement and bringing it down to 30 minutes. Even if it's invisible to you, what you have just done is saved yourself an hour and a half that week. If you can consistently do that and make it a habit, you are actually buying yourself an enormous amount of time every week and every month. 
I think you make a really good point because I've never regretted saying no to something, ever. Because like once I say no, it's out of my mind. But I have regretted saying yes. Because I'll dread it the whole time. Like a week before, two weeks before, I'm like dreading it. And I'm going through the event, it still sucks. I'm like, I just wish I said no. So like, yeah, I think it's a good, a good approach. And then downgrading the request. Like, hey, do you have an hour? No, how about you use the email and let me know what you want to know. <laughs> and we'll see if there is an hour. So I think pre-qualifying the ask too is another approach. Because maybe it is a good opportunity, but when someone reaches out to you on LinkedIn and says, hey, I'd love to chat, well, explain this love for chatting. You know, why, 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 would, why would you like to chat? Like, what do you want to chat about? And then from there, you can make a better decision. Absolutely, yes. This is, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, one of the strategies that I share in the long game is basically that a small, a small thing that we can do, it may sound counterproductive, right? If you, if you want to dispatch a request more quickly, you might think the worst thing you could do is send them an email back and engage them in further conversation. Like, oh, doesn't that just drag it out? The truth is no, it actually expedites things. Because if you simply ask the question, oh, okay, Terry, you said you, you want to chat. What would you like to chat about? Oh, all of a sudden you are doing a lot of important things. Number one, we assume the other person has actually taken the time to figure out what they want to ask or what they want to talk about. That is not always true. So it forces them to clarify it. Number two, they tell you what they want to talk about. In many cases, this is actually not appropriate. You know, you know, the mythical Terry might say to me, oh, Dory, well, I really wanted to get your advice about how to break into speech writing. Well, you know, I used to work in politics and I did some speech writing for candidates, but I haven't been in politics in 15 plus years. I have no idea how to break into speech writing. I could not help that person. And so I can very easily tell them, oh, I'm so sorry, I wish I could be of help, but I really can't, rather than wasting an hour having coffee with someone that it's, it's not any utility. So just those clarifying things can actually take care of a lot of requests that actually wouldn't be useful to either of you. Yeah, and you made a point earlier, and it's also in the book, about thinking in waves. And the very first wave is learning. Right? And when I was reading the book Stand Out, I was learning a lot, but sometimes I have a fear of completion with books because I'm like, well, I haven't gotten the outcome yet. I'm not standing out yet. But it's like, yeah, you actually have to apply what you've learned. So how, you know, of course I'd love for you to go through all the stages, but how do we avoid getting stuck in these stages such as learning? Because knowledge uninvested in labor is wasted. It's one of my favorite quotes by Jim Rome. And I think sometimes we accumulate knowledge, accumulate knowledge, and sometimes mistake the accumulation with the actual outcome you're gonna get, but you actually have to apply it in order to get that desired outcome. So do you mind just double clicking on that, going through the phases of this uh, thinking in waves? Yeah, thank you so much, Terry. So the thinking in waves strategy really came from the work that I did with coaching clients or, or people who have been in my orbit and being able, and folks in my recognized expert community of whom there are many here tonight, so welcome friends, so nice to, to see all of you. When you are working closely with a fairly large number of folks, there's been 600 plus people who've been through the Recognize Expert program, you begin to, to really see trends and patterns. And one of the places where I would often see some challenges is sometimes people would come to me and they'd feel frustrated because they'd say, well, I'm not making as much progress as I want or you know, I'm not getting the results I want. And if you dig just a little bit deeper, what you often see is that the issue is that folks are working really hard, that is true, but understandably, right? They're working hard at the things they're already good at and the things that they like doing. And the problem is that we cannot get away with just doing those things. In order to be successful, we have to transition and we have to move into different waves. And so in the book, I talk about four principal waves uh, that I feel like it's, we need to be thinking about it as a circle. You know, this is, this is a pattern that we need to go through at various points in our life. And so, ultimately, you know, we start, of course, with the learning wave, right? If we're in a new job, a new company, a new industry, you need to figure out what's going on. So a lot of it is just taking in information. You're meeting people, you're learning the lay of the land. That makes sense. Next, we need to shift into creation and, and actually creating and giving back. Because it's a problem, right? If all we're doing is just, you know, oh, well, I'll do, I'll do another course, I'll learn a new thing, I'll meet a new person. Well, that's all great, but eventually you have to start contributing. You need people to know that you have good ideas, that you have something to offer, rather than just being the sponge that's soaking things up. 
The third phase is what I call the connecting wave. Because if you want to amplify your impact, if you really want to actually be able to get your ideas heard, to sharpen them with the input of other people, and to have other people be uh, a force for amplifying your best ideas, you need relationships so that you're not the only person who is talking about these things. And then finally, we go into what I call the reaping mode. And that's really where you know, you're kind of clicking on all cylinders, right? You've gotten where you want to go, you've hit your stride, you know, things are finally working, it is great, it is worth celebrating that. And it is also really important to recognize we can't stay there. We can't stay there forever because the world changes. And if we try to keep milking that forever, eventually it's going to run out and it's going to become incredibly unsatisfying for us and for the people around us. So we need to proactively shift back into learning mode and create a new cycle for ourselves so that we don't get complacent. And by doing that, that's how we can keep ourselves fresh and keep ourselves moving forward. You make an amazing point about the reading phase because on my end, I do a lot of podcasts, do a lot of speaking, but there was a while last year when I got sick of hearing myself speak. So I was saying the same thing over and over again. There was nothing new coming in. You must consume to create. So I just stopped. I'm like, I have to learn more. I have nothing new to share, and I'm boring myself as well as the audience is, is an effect of that. So um, I think I've been super, there, brother. <laughs> I think that's super brilliant. You're not boring me, though. <laughs> so, um, but let's go back to the connecting wave, because I think some people try to go from learning to reaping or they go to connecting to expecting way too quick. So how do you connect, right? Because you know, prior to 2020, you could go to a bunch of uh, you know, corporate spaces, you can go to you know, in-person events, so on and so forth. But during COVID, you know, it was mostly on LinkedIn, right? And it's like, after a while, it's like those virtual cups of coffee, like it, it, it kind of got old. So how do you, to your point, stand out in this noisy world where you're not bugging someone, but you're also finding a way to break through and just make some kind of real connection? Yeah, such, such a good question. I'll, I'll touch on the virtual aspect shortly. But before I do, you got to tell us a story about stalking Jason Pfeiffer. Okay. This guy's good at connecting. Okay, so my story of connecting with Jason? Yes. Okay, so, all right. So, I've, um, this is like back in, must have been June of 2017. My goal was to be a writer for Forbes or Entrepreneur. That was my goal. I actually wrote that down in one of my Facebook groups. Like within a year, I'll be a writer for Forbes or Entrepreneur. So I'm stalking Jason Pfeiffer, who's the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine online. I'm commenting on all his posts, trying to get like just a like, you know, just a like or like a ha-ha or 100 emoji or like whatever. And he even would have accepted a thumbs up, even that. I mean, you know, yeah. Just acknowledge I exist was my goal, right? And, and he did, but there was no real connection just on, online. Uh, but one weekend, I was taking my daughter, Lena, at the time she was two years old, to this uh, gymnastics, free gymnastics class here in Brooklyn, or in Brooklyn, sorry, I don't know if once. And I walk in with my daughter, there's Jason Viper, with his son, Fen, who's the same age as my daughter. So I'm like, holy cow, there's Jason Viper. I gotta say that. So my daughter's like asking random, you know, daughter stuff, like, hey, you're good. Um, <laughs> I got to talk to Jason. And uh, I was telling him, hey, I love your podcast. And he's like, well, what do you love about it? Well, I'm like, last week you said this, the week before you said that. I shared that on my network, and that was really good, and here's why. So now his wife's like, like Jason, we gotta go. It's your birthday. We had, it was his birthday. She's like, we gotta go. We have reservations. She's like, no, hold on, Scott, let's my podcast. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're talking, we're vibing. And, um, you know, fast forward to today, that's how I got involved with Entrepreneur Magazine. So the stalking, I think, was beneficial. That was my research. But being a dad is what actually landed me the job. So it's a pretty cool story arc. So good, so good. Well, to take, so thank you for sharing that. And to take your point about virtual connection, I mean, certainly it was a challenge for everyone, right? You know, all the conferences we were used to going to, all of the, the organic ways that we were used to connecting with people sort of, sort of really did vanish overnight. And so during the pandemic, I actually wrote uh, with my friend Alyssa Cohn, who's going to be here shortly, uh, a couple of different pieces for Harvard Business Review about, um, about networking virtually and strategies around that. We began hosting uh, sort of virtual Zoom cocktails, which, you know, I, I think it's true. Uh, after, originally, everyone was like, oh, this is so cool. Like, everybody was, like, very into, like, 
any way to connect with people. And then I think we hit a certain point in the pandemic, you're right, where people are like, you know, kill me now if I have to be on <laughs> one more hour. Uh, but nonetheless, I think we are probably going to retain this in some form, and we were doing them like every week, uh, so it was, it was a lot. I think I'm going to retain them in some form moving forward in the future, because it turns out, I, I think pretty much every uh, company learned this as well, there actually are some legitimate advantages to being able to do it. For instance, my networking pre-COVID was pretty much, oh, if you're in New York, let's get together. If you're some, anywhere other than New York, let me know when you're in New York, <laughs> and then we can meet up. That was basically it. Now you can hold an event and actually find a legitimate way to have you know people in California and and you know Australia and Chicago and Canada like all together, and they are meeting each other, and that is actually much more serendipitous than just a bunch of people in New York City. Those people legitimately probably wouldn't get to know each other otherwise. So doing that, I think the stakes get raised a little bit though, because originally Zoom itself, like, oh, Zoom networking, that was enough of a novelty to draw people. Now you need to raise the bar a little bit more with, okay, well, but why? Are we all in the same industry or do we all have something in common? Like, why would it be interesting for me to meet these people? But if you, if you actually can provide that and provide a sort of international opportunity, then I think people do really still find that worth making time for. So you're nice enough to invite me to one of those those Zoom uh, round tables. And I was in my daughter's bedroom, so like there's like a little princess like like tent behind me, like a unicorn poster to the right. And I'm like, See, I invite Terry all kinds of things. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was nice just to be around other people, like even virtually, because I had not done anything. Several months, so I think there's a way to do that responsibly, and to the point where you don't, no one gets bored. One thing I liked about yours a lot was everyone had a chance to talk about something non-work related. Because like, if you really want to network with people, I often ask, "What do you do for fun?" Not "What do you do?" If I say, "What do you do for fun?" You're automatically in a good mood. You know, you're talking about things that make you happy instead of me saying, "Hey, let me free qualify whether it's not worth if it's worth talking to you anymore." So I think it's a, a good approach, but. One thing you mentioned in the book as well was infinite horizon networking, which is not an upgrade to BIOS, uh, but I would love for Dory to explain <laughs> who that is, please. Absolutely. So in the long game, one of the sections uh, that I talk about is kind of the, the varieties of networking, you could say. And of course, there's, there's short-term networking, which I think is, is the kind that probably is in most people's mind is the caricature of networking. It's like a bad networking, right? Like I need a thing, you're gonna get me a thing. And of course, obviously, we want to avoid that. That's not how we want to be in the world. But even among what I would call sophisticated networkers or um, people who are a little more experienced in networking, I feel like there's often a piece that is overlooked. If you are a reasonably sophisticated networker, what you are good at is what I will typically call long-term networking and that's you know hey I don't I don't really have a thing that I need from him I you know but I want to get to know him he seems cool he seems interesting we're sort of in the same world you're talking about me I'm talking about you Ta yeah of course <laughs> <laughs> so you know so we're going to get to know each other right and you know maybe he can do something for me someday maybe I can do something for him someday who knows but let's let's connect because there's something good there right that's that's the vibe that is how a good networker operates. But even a good networker often overlooks infinite horizon networking. And that, frankly, is networking with people who seem totally irrelevant to you. Even a good networker typically screens people based on some kind of relevance. Oh, well, you know, we're in the same town, or oh, we're in the same industry. They often ignore people who seem like they are just really outside of the scope of what they do. But that is often where most of the magic can happen. Because if we're thinking about the innovation potential of networking, these are folks, folks who are in radically different industries or life experiences or parts of the world, these are the people who are more likely to be able to teach you things you wouldn't know otherwise, expose you to different pieces of information, change the way you think, and also, who knows, right? They may actually end up closer to you or vice versa uh, in terms of your life path.
than you might imagine. In, in the long game, I tell a story about a guy who was an entrepreneur in Israel, and he was uh, he was an immigrant, and so it's kind of a way of giving back. He volunteered at a nonprofit that was like an immigrant aid organization, and there was a staffer there that he became buddies with because they would like he was on the committee for like you know oh it's the forum celebration or whatever you know and they plan an event together, and so he was just pals with this random guy who was a staffer, and it turns out years later. The staffer ends up getting a job at the Technion, which is Israel's premier sort of MIT-like institution. And he's working with this like tech accelerator. And so the non the former nonprofit staffer guy remembers the dude who volunteered, who is an entrepreneur, and invites him to present and to connect with the different delegations. That ends up with the entrepreneur, Haim, getting a board seat on a Brazilian startup. That has been very successful, and you know this was not a plan. This was the infinite horizon of him volunteering for a charitable cause that he cared about. So I think for all of us, if we just open up a little bit more, we can often open up opportunity in that way. And it's a cool word. Um, <laughs> I know we're going to shift the questions soon, so uh, let me um, let me ask one. I think it's important for me and everyone else here. So you're completely bought in on the long game, right? You know, you're you're you're, you're on this. You're you're a big fan. It would be a bad time if I weren't mad. <laughs> I'll speak about everyone, but I may not, I may not have to with you, so I get it. Um, <laughs> but let's assume you're someone here, you're completely bought in on the, on the long game, you're committed to it, but often we have stakeholders, we have partners, you know, we have coworkers. How do we bring other people along to see this vision of a long game? Because with me, you know, there's my wife, and there's so many things I have to do in my career that I'm like, look, trust me, this is gonna work. You know, you're not just making a sacrifice now, it's for the long game. And, one of them was skipping my friend's wedding uh, to go speak at South by Southwest. So I'm like, it's not my you know, like, I mean, I like Wesley, but, <laughs> but I think I gotta go do this thing. And she's always been so supportive because she saw my vision, but how do we bring other people into that vision as well? Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad that you raised that possibility because actually hearkening back to one of my earlier books, um, my very first book, Reinventing You, one of the, the pieces that I wrote about that actually, I think, was one that, that often resonated in unexpected ways with audiences was the fact that a point I made in, in Reinventing You is that oftentimes we assume, erroneously, typically, that the people who are closest to us are going to be our biggest boosters in our reinvention. We often assume that they'll be like, oh, that's an amazing idea. Yeah, honey, you can do it. And yet, Ironically, uh, in, in many cases, you know, thankfully not all, but in many cases, it's the people closest to us that are the biggest skeptics. Because somehow, they feel like there's a need that, oh, they have to be the devil's advocate. Or, oh gosh, you know, maybe he really just hasn't thought this through. He probably doesn't understand the risks. Let me tell him. <laughs> or they feel somehow threatened. You know, their, their financial well-being or their identity might be threatened by this reinvention. And so it can become, you know, sometimes sad or ironic that, uh, that the people that we thought, oh, well, definitely they'll be in my corner, uh, are not. And so a point that I make in, in Reinventing You is that we often have to treat our relatives like a constituency group, that we have to be thoughtful about persuading, that we can't take it for granted. Um, we actually need to really be making the case and explain to them, to, to lay it out, so that they understand that reinvention, so that they can then become part of the team and be part of it. But we have to be mindful of controlling that narrative up front. And so, similarly, when it comes to the law game, it's true, not everybody uh, up front is going to see the value in it. I think societally, we all, we all theoretically believe in long-term thinking, right? Like, you know, everybody's like, Yes, yes, this sounds like a good idea. But when push comes to shove, what the long game represents is about actually making, the, the way that I define it, sometimes people say, well, you know, what is playing the long game? What is you know, being strategic? The way that I talk about it, or the way that I think about it in my own life, is it's about making the choices today that will make tomorrow better or easier. And the truth is, some of those choices are actually the hard choice now. And so when it plays out in reality, people often don't like that. But 
I think if we keep coming back to, to first principles, if we keep coming back to the vision and just reminding people of that vision, as you were saying, Terry, it's, it's really all we can do. Uh, up to a certain point, I mean, this is about faith. It's about the faith that your hard work will pay off in the future. One of the things that I uh, reference toward the end of the book is the, the well-known marshmallow study, the famed, uh, the famed psychology study about the kids and the marshmallows. And, you know, oh, you can, okay, you can have one marshmallow if you eat it now, or you can have two marshmallows if you wait, just wait 15 minutes. And it was testing the kids, can you wait 15 minutes? Can you have that delayed gratification? And there's a lot of interesting uh, research that has been done about it. I mean, number one, of course, is that um, kids who come from unstable backgrounds where they actually can't trust the, the promise, they're like, give me the freaking marshmallow. <laughs> and they're right, they're completely right. But another piece that I think is important for all of us to recognize is that what they saw is it's not, it is not a study that says, oh, people are one thing or another. People forever and ever are just, you know, they're the marshmallow gobblers or they're the patient ones. That is not true. It's actually any kid and any person, the study showed, has the ability to learn techniques that will enable them to be more effective in learning how to delay gratification. If you take the time to just learn a few strategies, the, the kids who have learned them can be just as effective as the ones who seem to, to grasp it uh, intuitively. And so for all of us, I mean, human nature, let's be honest, human nature biases us toward immediate gratification. But we also recognize, I think, that for meaningful goals, for the goals that actually really matter, inevitably, many of them do take a long time. That's just the nature of pursuing something worth having. And the more that we can keep our eyes trained on that and to recognize that it can be a long journey, that there probably are going to be detours, but that we expect them and therefore can plan for them, it often can give us the strength and perseverance so that we can get what we want at the other side and, and make the impact that we want. That was powerful. <laughs> <laughs> and I think uh, this is a perfect part to wrap up on for right now. I believe we're going to answer some questions. Um, so. If anyone wants to buy this book, I recommend we just do a quick little breakdown of that, and then we can continue on with the questions if that's okay. Sounds good to me. <laughs> All right, apparently we're taking a brief book purchase break. <laughs> Call, that's called a call to action in, in the e-commerce world. Unless it was already done earlier. Mm -hmm. All right, we need to start with Q&A here, and I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and go first with the question. So, Dory, on your end, how can we tell things are working? Because the long game obviously takes a long time to take effect. What are some signs we would see along the way? Actually, I'll, I'll show you this one. Hey, raise your hand if you can hear me. Nice. I also teach at NYU, and that's what we do. <laughs> when, when everyone's talking. Um, so I'll reiterate the question. Uh, the long game obviously takes a long time. So what are some clues we can see along the way to let us know that it is working and that all our passion, all our energy is going to pay off eventually? Well, th thank you, Terry. I appreciate it. So one of the big questions that I get in uh, the long game and I'm just gonna walk around like Jerry Springer so that I can shape people who are talking. Yeah, thanks everybody. Hey, oh hi Van, how's it going? Van's featured in the book. You should get the book just so you can see Van in it. This is good. Excellent, hello. Thank you, all right. I'm just wending my way around so we all know that we're back into Q&A mode. Thank you so much. All right, fantastic. So, so to answer your question, one of the biggest challenges when it comes to playing the long game is really getting a sense of whether something is not working or whether it is not working yet. And in that moment when we don't know, <laughs> that really, really long moment, it can be actually very painful because there's a lot of self-doubt. Uh, I wrote a, a piece uh, that came out a month or so ago in 
the Harvard Business Review magazine, and they were talking, uh, they meaning me, I was talking about, uh, <laughs> about this process. Uh, David Galenson is an economist at the University of Chicago, and he actually has an interesting subspecialty. He studies the economics of art and art markets and how basically uh, tracking how well an artist is, is perceived as, as being um, tracked by the price that people pay for their art at different periods in their career. And basically from the beginning, everyone thought Picasso was a genius, you know, and that's, that's handy for Picasso, right? Like there's some people who get famous when they're in their 20s and it's just, you know, they're famous forever. And it, it's, uh, it's very nice because there's a lot of validation associated with that. For many of us, that is not the case. And we have to scrap and scrap and scrap until we get recognized. And that was much more the case for Cezanne, who up into, until his mid to late 40s, everybody thought he was not successful at all. They thought his work was kind of junk. And now, with the benefit of history and historical science, hindsight, we realize, no, actually, that was really not junk. That was actually pretty good. Um, but you can imagine that here he is, you know, 40, and he hasn't made anything of himself, and his art isn't selling, and no one seems to like it. And even if it turns out that history later thinks that you're one of the most seminal painters in Western civilization, you actually feel pretty bad about yourself. And so that is what we, in our own ways, need to overcome. And so uh, there's a concept that I talk about in the long game called looking for the raindrops. And what I mean by this is that so often we are so fixated on the, out, on the ultimate outcome. You know, like, oh, well, when I get the big promotion, when I get to keynote South by Southwest, or when I get the cover story in Fast Company magazine, that's when I'll have succeeded. And we wait for it and we look for it. But those things take a long time. And if that's the only measure of success we're looking at, we're gonna be waiting a long time and we're gonna feel pretty bad for a long time. But the good news is that it is very rare that a rainstorm starts out of the blue. Mostly we see there are gathering clouds. Mostly we start to feel just a few little raindrops. And they're so subtle that at first, you don't even know that they're raindrops. You, 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 you have no idea, you're like, was that an air conditioner? And then you turn to your friends, you're like, hey, did you feel something? You aren't sure. It's that subtle. But we need to train ourselves to look for those things because those are the signs. You're never gonna be invited overnight to keynote at South by Southwest, but could you be a panelist on a workshop at South by Southwest? Yes, that might actually happen. And that is a sign that you are moving in the right direction. If you start to get Thank you notes from clients saying how much they appreciate what you do, that is a sign. If you start to get invited to meetings that you weren't invited to before, that's a sign. We need to look for those things and recognize them because that is what keeps us going. I think it's brilliant the way that you describe that. It's like, you know, like you just these little 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 drops. You're like, wait a second, is this is this, is this really is this happening? If you don't recognize and acknowledge those moments, you will never have enough motivation or energy to get to the rainstorm, right? So I think it's really important to mentally bookmark those things. And before we have any questions, please do get them ready. Um, another story about just having more strategic patience. On my end, I wanted to speak at Social Media Week years ago. And I'm like, yeah, I'd love to speak at Social Media Week. And they're like, no. I'm like, all right, cool. I said, well, I noticed on your website you have all these recaps of some of the most popular talks. Can I write a recap about your talks? They're like, sure, and here's this $2,000 platinum badge you can get access to the speakers afterwards. I'm like, that worked, right? So then I became known as the conference recap guy and just kept on going to conference and saying, hey, can I write a recap for these events? Two years later, I was on stage at, at um, Social Media Week in LA giving a keynote, but it started off from getting that rejection first, not letting ego be the enemy of progress, and then still moving forward by writing these, these blogs. So yeah, I mean, what you're saying in your book about that strategic patience, I, I live it, and that's why I appreciate it, but on your end, you always learn it, live it, and teach it, and that's what I see in all your books, so, so thank you for that. Thank you, Terry, thank you for sharing your story. I'm, I, I'm metaphorically dropping the mic now, because Terry Rice it tells it like it is, that was so good. <laughs> well, pick the mic up back up, because we got some questions. So, <laughs> who, who would like to ask some questions? 
Are we going to go right here? Yeah, thank you. Hi, Dory. I was just curious about how you came up with the concept of the long game, and particularly if something was happening because, you know, over the last year and a half, everything has been so short-term uh, thinking. So how did you come up with this? Thank you, Denise. I appreciate it. Well, you you will see for anyone who picks up a copy, and, and thanks to the kind Saxworks people who are selling it there, and it looks like there's a, a few more available if anyone wants, suddenly decides they want to pick up another one. We appreciate it. But you will see this book is dedicated to two people or two groups of people. You could say one is my mama, and the second is my Rexers. And uh, I have a community called the Recognized Expert Community. It is the, the online course and community that I run, and of which you are a wonderful member. And uh, there are many. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go Braxers. That's right. Uh, just, just because I like, I like people to be able to, to meet each other, to get to know each other. If you are a member of the community, would you mind raising your hand so that folks can, can meet each other afterwards? Just like look around. Look around and say hi to your fellow Rexers afterwards so you can make friends. Uh, I'm so glad you guys are here. Really, you guys inspired this because in working over the past five years with the community, I mean, the, the premise of the community is it's a, it's a group of you know, very smart, good, talented people who are looking to grow their platform and find ways to get their ideas heard more. And so, I have seen so many patterns in terms of where people um, get frustrated, where they, where they hit snags, where they get discouraged. And I wanted to write a book and create a framework that really was about helping people be able to push through that so that good people would not give up too soon. And that was what I was striving to do with the book. Well, it's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Can you tell the story about your mom and her braces? Oh, I can, absolutely. Hopefully mom's still tuning in on the live stream so that you can see it here. But yeah, I, thank you. But a story that I love, I mean, you know, anybody who is a parent uh, probably knows intellectually, but here, here's just one more reinforcement for you. Um, that, you know, we always say that kids don't really learn from what you tell them, they learn from what they see. And so something that really struck me, I mean, talk about like walking the talk. When I was 13, like a lot of 13-year-olds, pretty much everybody in my class, I got braces. And this was pre-subtle braces. <laughs> this is like the ugly, terrible metal braces. And so, you know, for, for a good two years, this, you know, this was just like, you know, classic teenage humiliation. Um, but the crazy thing that happened was at that same time, my mom also got braces. My mom in her 50s got braces. And her friends were all like, what are you doing? Because they were ugly. <laughs> it was terrible. You know, nobody likes to have braces. And these, these were like extreme braces. And, you know, for, for these two years of suffering, my mom suffered right along with me. And all her friends said, why are you doing this? And she said, I decided I can be two years older or I can be two years older with straight teeth. And I think that is the mantra for all of us. Do we want to do the work now so that we can be two years older with straight teeth? Oh, yeah. Yes. And <laughs> shout out to Maria, the dentist, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We all want straight teeth. Yes, we do. And I thought I saw another hand go up. Was it over? Okay. I did my time, too. Nice. Um, nice. I also thought I was going to get hit by a bolt of lightning because there was so much freaking metal. Um, so, uh, first of all, I just hope your hand doing well because I have a number of things to resign. <laughs> so a follow-on question, and that the, the clients that I work with, corporate clients particularly, have just fallen into a major league funk because the road ahead seems so uncertain. COVID just threw everything into, I thought we knew what we were doing, I thought we knew how we could move forward, and I don't know how to be sustainable in holding on to that when it could turn on a dime and so, words of wisdom on holding on to hope in the middle of this VUCA war. <laughs> yes, oh, thank you, Peg. I appreciate that question. And I think we all can relate. I mean, this has been, this has been a pretty traumatic time for everybody. And it's, it's manifested, of course, in different ways for all of us, but everybody has been affected. And, you know, it's sort of this like societal trauma that we're coming out of. And the way that I think about it, you know, one of the, the stories that I tell at the beginning of the long game 
is I, I signed, I got the word from my publisher uh, from HBR Press that they had accepted the book. I got the email on February 28, 2020, and then like literally the next week, it's like, ah, the entire world exploded. And during that time, shortly thereafter, there was a guy that I, I sort of, you know, had, had, uh, I didn't know him very well, but there was a guy that I had met, and he was asking, he's like, you know, what are you up to? And I said, oh, I'm writing a book. And he said, what's it about? And I said, oh, it's a long-term thing. And he just, like, literally laughed at me. He's like, ha, ha, ha. well, no one needs that now. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh. <laughs> Somebody might need it, maybe. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, I'm a believer in long-term thinking. But I have to say that I, I am um, especially a believer now because it is true, you know, much like life is both a sprint and a marathon, COVID showed that we do need short-term thinking. It is not inherently bad to be a short-term thinker for periods of time. When there is a crisis, you do need to be able to move quickly. You do need to be able to just react and respond. But it's also true that we can't live our lives like that. We can't live our lives driven by cortisol and fear and just seeing what comes at us. That's, that's not the way to end up with the outcome that we want. You know, the way that I think of it is it's sort of like, you know, being a jellyfish, right? Like, well, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really matter if you're a jellyfish if you don't care where you end up. But most of us do actually care where we end up. And so for me, long-term thinking is actually literally, it's a way of fighting back against COVID. I mean, not frankly that COVID cares, but I care. Fuck you, COVID. This is the way we fight back. Because it forced us into so much reactivity that it's just not healthy for us over the long term. And it is easy to get into a cycle that that's just the way that we, we forget. We think that's how things are. But it's not. It is true. Are we going to get you know some other crazy variant? Maybe. Are, are other things going to happen uh, that we can't predict? Of course. And whatever plans that we set out, it is almost inevitably true that it will not play out in precisely the way that we imagine. But it is also true that if we engage in long-term thinking, if we take the time to really carve out a vision for ourselves, that is the only thing that makes it possible for us to actually attain that goal or at least come close to attaining that goal. I believe in being directionally correct. If we can move in the direction that we want, we will be better off than if we just continue to react and react and react. And so for me, it's about putting our stake in the ground. And I think that long-term thinking for me is a way that we can really begin to do that. I was wondering if we could swear or not, so thank you for answering that question. Um, <laughs> and yeah, with the whole COVID thing, I mean, I always tell people, like, don't let, like, a short-term situation impact your self-worth, right, or your self-esteem. Like, you have to have, you know, like, focus on your controllables, whatever they may be, even though the situation's going to change. So I think you're going to read that very well and, and swore. Um, so get some more questions here, because I have plenty, but I want to make sure everyone else has a chance to do so as well. Hey. Thank you so much. So a couple of really good questions in there. One is, you know, what is long term? If we're thinking about is it 10 years, is it 20, what does that mean? And how does that factor in with the great resignation and a lot of the movement of, you know, millennials or Gen Z that want to, you know, make big changes for themselves. So thank you. It's a lot of meaty things to unpack. So I would say in terms of in terms of timing and long term, I mean on one hand, we can all define it for ourselves, right? You know, we, we, we know what sort of horizons we want. For me, I don't want to be too prescriptive, but it's really just a question like, you know, where, where do we want to go? Where do we want to end up? What do we want our lives to look like? And for me personally, I like to have, 
10 or 20 year goals. Um, you know, I, I think ultimately if we get too much beyond that, I'm, I'm not really sure. It's like, it's, it's sort of uh, foggy beyond that, but I, I am able to come up with these 10 and 20 year goals. And so my 10 year goal, which I recount uh, quite a bit actually in the long game, is that I decided in 2016 that I wanted to write a show that would end up on Broadway. And so I have been assiduously pursuing this. And I'm halfway there now, I'm at, the, at the five year mark of, uh, of this goal. And you know, I don't know if I will write a show that actually gets to Broadway in 2026, but that has been the North Star guiding me. And I can tell you I went in the past five years from not knowing how to write a musical, to having written a musical, to having completed, along with a couple of my great colleagues here, uh, a prestigious musical theater training program and being immersed in that world. So that's part of it. My 20 year goal is to become a United States ambassador. So that's what I'm working on. <laughs> can you vote for that? Because I'll vote for you if you can. I don't know if that's, <laughs> that's, that's, if that's a thing or not. Um, but going back to your point about the great resignation, you made a great point. And people aren't resigning, they're moving on to different tracks of life. Like a lot of it's driven by women, to be honest, who are leaving the workforce and going into entrepreneurship, which I think is amazing because you have much more control of your outcomes. But I actually wrote an article about this the heavy load of women that they experience, even when you know when they have kids, even when there's a, another parent present, right? So it's like that invisible work you see. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, shoot, I'm doing all this stuff. And I have this nine to five. I'm not going to get more control of my life. I think that's where we're seeing with the great resignation. It's not people just quitting their jobs and saying, "I want more fulfillment." You know, I don't want to go back to this job because there's other things I can do with my talent and my time, right? But um, to go deeper, just uh, again to the long game, and you're saying, you know, how long is the horizon? Would it be beneficial to find someone who's a mentor, whether you know them or not, and just think, okay, how long does it take them to see some signs? That is that a good like kind of yardstick to kind of judge your progress by? Yeah, thank you, Terry. I think that's that's exactly right. I mean, certainly for, for everybody, the path is a little bit different, but it's also true that the path is often not wildly different. So if you have a goal and it took somebody else, if you do the research and it took somebody else 10 years, it is unlikely that it would take you six months, right? And yet, for so many of us, we're often flying blind about these things. There's a, a story that I tell in the book about uh, a letter, a shareholder letter that Jeff Bezos wrote in 2018 to Amazon shareholders. And he tells a story of a friend of his who decided that she wanted to learn how to do handstands in yoga. And so, you know, smart woman, she hires a handstand coach. And this handstand coach uh, told her that the average person, if you ask them to guess how long it takes to master a yoga handstand, they'll say probably about two weeks. And it turns out that is not correct. It actually takes six months, okay, 24 weeks, to be able to do a yoga handstand. Now, most people probably, you know, if they don't know, they're probably uh, comfortable saying, you know, my estimate could be off a little bit. Maybe my estimate's off by 20%, 30%. I want to emphasize, their estimate is off by 12 X, by 12 times. They have not researched it, so they don't know. But for so many of us, that same thing is true. We want to achieve something, but if we haven't actually specifically mapped out and said, okay, let me find a person who has done this, let me see exactly what it took, we are flying blind too. And that's also a point where a lot of good people, I think, unfortunately, give up too soon because they get discouraged. You know, if, they've been, if they think it's gonna take two weeks and they've been doing it for 10 and it hasn't worked, well, what are you gonna think? You're gonna think, well, I guess I'm not good at this. Or, gosh, I guess this isn't for me. I don't have any talent here. Well, no, it's just that you're less than halfway to what it would take anyone. So understanding the scope of what we're trying to accomplish is so crucial because that enables us to plan out what the journey looks like and prepare ourselves for it. Yeah, go ahead. No, it's interesting. The U.S. business sort of has a reputation for being more short-term oriented compared to its overseas rivals, say Japan or, or Germany or, or even China. Um, is that, um, and, and that's been considered part of the success of it, or reason for success, that it's responsive 
does that actually underestimate the long-term orientation of U.S. business? Are there reserves of long-term thinking in U.S. business that maybe aren't, um, aren't recognized? I think this is an important point. I mean, certainly there, there are many instances, and you know, for anybody that's, uh, that's in a, a family firm, for instance, you know, the goal really is around generations. But in the corporate world, you know, all of us can take off examples of sort of the opposite of the extreme short term. Like, oh, you know, we need to, we need to get our earnings up. Hmm, let's invent five million accounts. That's a good idea, right? Um, so we all can think of the bad examples. But I think it really is important to celebrate the good ones. And, you know, going, going back to our friends at Amazon, uh, for, for, all, uh, for, for all of the challenges uh, with, with Amazon's dominance in the marketplace, they really deserve a lot of credit because for many years, they, they were aggressively explicit with their shareholders, do not expect a profit. We are pouring our money back into the company. We are pouring our money back into R&D. And in fact, going back a decade, 2011, there was an interview that Jeff Bezos did with Wired Magazine, and in it, he explained what he thought of as the company's secret to their success. Now, you know, obviously, Amazon is way bigger 10 years later than it was in 2011, but even then, it was a successful enterprise. And what he said at the time was he thought that the number one secret to Amazon's success was that Amazon was willing to invest on a seven-year horizon meaning they were willing to wait seven years for their bets to pay off. Whereas he said that the other companies were really only willing to invest on a three-year horizon. And because of that, because they were willing to be more patient with their capital, with their investments, they could tackle bigger and more meaningful projects. And when we look at the things that today have provided the competitive moat that Amazon has, whether that is Amazon Prime, whether that is the, uh, of course, Amazon Web Services, all of those things are a result of those early investments that now have become huge. Majority, we do have to wrap things up now, but this has been amazing, so thank you very much for sharing your wisdom with us. It was definitely worth the 18 month wait uh, to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure we're all enjoying well. Saxworks for having us. I, I think uh, we're going to hear some, some brief instructions. If you would like to purchase a copy and you haven't, I think there's still a few more available. I'm happy to sign them. And of course, one thing that authors always uh, appreciate is people spreading the word. So if you are able to, sh you know, maybe you can even get a picture of us or a picture of yourself with a book and share it on social media or write, speaking of which, an Amazon review, it is always gratefully received. Thank you so much, everyone. Right, thank you guys for coming, and most importantly, thank you guys for coming as well. So, Dory actually took one of the announcements. The other announcement is you guys are welcome to stick around, enjoy the space. If anyone wants a tour afterwards, anyone from the Saxworks team um, can help you along. And then, yeah, basically post photos and whatnot. Um, enjoy. And then we will be closing the space in 30 minutes. So, I'm just giving you a heads up. Get those power photos in and those questions <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.